I, I mean, you're you're a little older than me, so I, I gotta ask because I didn't I didn't experience it this way with you, with where people got tired of of Dusty's booking and Dusty at that time. So I'll ask uh, because I, I've heard many stories from from uh, folks. I mean, I, I've I've heard like um, John Hitchcock's a friend of yours, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. I've heard yes. him talk about the booking on um like uh brian last's show the 605 super podcast and even uh jeff bowdrin's show i think jeff Bowdrin, I'm, i may be getting them confused on what show you're, you're, I listen right. To both of them. you're right you're right so and i've heard i've heard him talk about you know just being tired of of dusty's booking so i i guess i should ask you since i've never really spoke to john were you one of those people who was just like okay i'm just getting sick and tired of this this is just absurd it's just I, i'm tired of dusty at this point Yes, I was. Now, I have to say that um, I was getting sick and tired of Dusty um, right at the elbow of John because we were we went to the shows together um, <laughs> like my longest term wrestling friend. I mean, right. it's like it's, to this day, it's like, hey, you want to go to this? And I, I don't we don't go to everything now, but, you know, people's lives change. But but he still keeps up. I still buy my comic books on Wednesdays from his shop. And, um, you know, we're still tight, but, but we saw all of that stuff together, you know, so right. you could see, um, and we were kind of like, um, I got the observer, the wrestling observer in, um, 87. And I remember the first issue was Jerry Lawler got his head shaved. So that's where I, that's where I kind of tacked. So we were like watching stuff and learning about it from watching it. And then the observer came along and we figured out more from that. And so, um, but the thing was, it was like, you know, Ric Flair was the hometown hero and then Dusty came in and they were careful about it pretty much. But they always said like these two had some trouble, but you know, Flair would be a heel sometimes and a baby face. Sometimes they'd mix it up and, 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 um, and clearly when they, you know, in the Carolinas itself, you know, people loved Dusty Rhodes when he first got there. I mean, it was like pandemonium, you know, like it really got hot in 85 and 86. And he brought in, you know, an energetic new crew they, that, that they needed and, um, you know, made Tully Blanchard into a national heel and, and, you know, feuding with Dusty and then Flair. But the whole story was that, Flair was nowhere near as – as the NWA champion was nowhere near as good as Dusty. And the reason why they were full horsemen wasn't because it was the coolest thing in the world and everybody was going to love it 25 years later or even then. It was they wanted Flair to have a gang of stooges that Dusty could beat up and he could beat up Flair and it would give him ways to win every single match with Flair, never really sell. But um, – those other guys would sell, you know, the, the bad guys would sell and it would be clear that Dusty was really better than Ric Flair. And you just pay all the time to see, you know, the next match was going to be the match where Dusty finally beat Flair for the title or beat Tully for the title or whoever, because he was better than everybody. And, you know, you'd watch the shows and, and then, um, you know, we didn't know in the beginning that was Dusty calling all the shots. I mean, that was part of it, but there were two things about the, the, what was called the Dusty finish the titles meant something. Fans wanted to see the the good guys win and the bad guys lose. And so they would go to the shows, and it would look like the good guys had won the titles. And, you know, the, because um, they would do this pattern of – and they do the same finish all the time. You didn't have to th – you didn't have to necessarily believe that wrestling was – you know, predetermined, but you started noticing like the, like the same thing would happen. And those fans started feeling ripped off and they, they blamed the promotion because their guy would, um, you know, this guy would win the, you know, the, um, the, you know, Magnum would, um, beat Ric Flair, um, because a referee would go down, another referee would come out, um, before the other referee came out, Ric Flair would throw Magnum over the top rope. It wasn't even a big deal. He'd just kind of throw him over the top rope while Tommy Young was laying there acting like he was dead. The other referee would come out <laughs> from the back. Um, then Magnum would beat Flair like one, two, three. Oh, my God, we have a new champion. Everybody would be all, – all the, you know, all the fans would be celebrating. And then Tommy Young would go – would kind of pull the rug out from him and go, no, I, you know, I'm an honest referee. And I saw Flair throw him over the top rope. And from the moment I saw that, Ric Flair was disqualified because I'm the referee. You know, I'm, yeah. uh, you know, I'm still the referee. And so the first time you do that, I remember going to Dorton Arena in Raleigh and seeing, you know, packed house. They did it with Dusty and Flair. And people were going crazy and they loved it. You know, it was like, oh, my God, I came, you know, half an inch away from Dusty – becoming the NWA champion 
again. But Dusty would book that same finish all up and down the card with any title matches. Just time after time, when the referee would fall down, you would literally see hundreds of people turn their head toward the back because they knew that either the bad guys were running down to beat somebody up or that the other referee was on his way because they knew ex- they trained them to what was going to happen. And I can tell you they ran month to month in the Greensboro Coliseum and they were doing over 10,000 people you know, per month at those shows. And then we would walk out laughing because all we cared about was we wanted the heels to keep the titles and we didn't care how. You know, we knew what the deal was. <laughs> yeah. Just, just laugh at people like, you know, you know, he won the match. He beat him. You know, he beat him right there. One, two, three. Yeah. Um, who's got the belts? He must not have beaten him because he's the champion. Is he the champion? You know, you know, because we were jerks, you know, and, and, and that was fun. You know, like the yeah. ones, the one as many of us, you know, in this world now, we're all over everywhere, you know, and, and now it's not even heel fans. It's you're pushing the wrong guy fans. And right. so, um, you know, but and so we, but you'd walk out and you'd hear people going, "I'm never coming back to this crap again." What a rip off! And the, and then you go back the next month and it's six thousand people. Then you go back the next month and it's five thousand people. And I saw it, you know, like like what it was. And then Dusty was reacting to it like like someone was taking something from him. Like it wasn't his fault that it was um, that he was just angry that it wasn't working. And so he had always booked. Like, if you watch those shows, you'll notice that everybody brings up Dusty Rhodes. Like, no matter what feud you're in, you brought up Dusty Rhodes. You know, you either praised him if you were a good guy or, or, or you know, or brought him up and, and bitched about how scared you were of him if you were a bad guy. And so he did even more of that. And then he was getting bigger, more obese. He was more out of shape. And he was kind of angry in his promos. And he was... um. And then he was doing less and less in the ring. So you had these cool guys, you know, and Midnight Express are like this too. These cool guys who were great wrestlers. And then you had, and then you had, and they were younger than Dusty. And Flair was the epitome of this. He was in incredible shape, best wrestler in the world. And then he's, you know, they're literally, you know, Dusty would stand up, put his elbow up, wouldn't even move his elbow, and guys would run into it and fall down. And you're just like, <laughs> you're just like, you lazy son of a bitch. After a while, you're just like, you know, and then the answer is standing right there with Ric Flair. You know, it's like, there it is. You know, you're like, you're just like, yeah. come on. And, you know, they, they did it years later. They did it. They did it years later, but you're just like, good grief. And so um, things like the Midnight Rider, I don't know if you've gotten to that part. I, when, I mean, I, I've, I see, I've seen it in Mid-South, so it, it's. Yeah, okay. I, and, I mean, and I, 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 I vaguely I, remember it. I haven't seen. Here's the thing: I haven't seen these episodes in like, I mean, it's it's over thirty years. So I'm rewatching them, and it's amazing how much stuff I don't remember. I for whatever okay. reason. Well, I, when you're going to be getting that soon enough, it sounds like it sounds like either you would have seen it or it's coming up. Yeah. And when I see people talk about that stuff and they they show the promos and all that, um, I can tell you that was a it was a big home run angle, and it was a flop. And I very much remember because I remember going to a tell. It's like they'd done the angle. He's in the Midnight Rider. You know, he's in the Get Up, and it done well in Florida. And um, and I remember going to a TV, television taping again in Dorton Arena, and going to the television taping, and Dusty's just Dusty. And it's like, why is he? Where's the Midnight Rider outfit? What happened? It's like I didn't miss that much tell. I didn't. I never missed the television. Like what the hell? And it was just they knew it was di- it was dying at the box office, and so they just they just dumped it. And yeah. um, and then you had what you you know it was the John Cena Roman Reigns thing, except for you know with John Cena and Roman Reigns, any of those guys you don't um, you know everybody on the sh- the whole show isn't about them. No matter, it, you know, they're like, it seems like they're pushed really hard and they are, they're the top guys, but the whole show isn't about top guys. But when you would watch 605, when you'd watch the syndicated shows, which were important too, um, they were always all about Dusty and um, it got really obnoxious. It was just, and you can see the crowds going down like 87 is when it starts and they, you know, 86 is really good about to the end. 85 is on fire and then it's, um. You know, and then it's like, God, these are great wrestlers. You get some great matches and you get some stuff, but the, um, you know, the timing is all wrong. It's, you know, the Crockett's, um, when they needed cash to come in to, to expand, 
they weren't making as much money as they had been just a year or two before because they they just stayed Jim Crockett just stayed with Dusty and as as fans we were furious we were just like you're killing us you know it's like this is killing something we thought would last for it's the 50th anniversary of Jim Crockett promotion so we were like you know this is gonna this should be able to last this is better than and you know in our mind they had better wrestlers than and a lot of people's minds too that they had better wrestlers than WWF they had better shows you know WWF had the better production but you know they much more phony or much more kind of childish and um they you know the blood and guts was with this and 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 um it was kind of dying on the vine because of the ego of dusty Rhodes. so if people tell you that that's not a factor or it wasn't dusty's fault it was dusty was a huge factor in all that it's like it wasn't so much it wasn't they were getting beaten by the wwf and they were um they got outmaneuvered but um but a big part of it was Dusty spending so much money and on his own ego. And then just when things went down, he started booking himself even more stronger. He didn't back up. He, you know, you think, oh, they got Sting, they got Luger. It's like, well, it seemed like they were pushing, but really what they were doing was, you know, you know, Dusty Rhodes in there with Lex Luger at Starcade in, in the steel cage. It was Dusty Rhodes doing every cool move, the DDT and everything else at the time to show <laughs> that his big fat ass could still do it. And then, you know, Lex Luger just praising Dusty Rhodes to the skies after he beat him. And, you know, that was supposed to be, you know, it was all about, it, it seemed like it was getting the, um, you know, the new guy over, but it was about getting the old guy over. <laughs> you know, it was yeah. everybody, everything. I, I remember, I think John told the story where he said, um, I think, it, I think it was, I think he said Flair like walked up to him at the, like at, on the front row and he's like, where's everybody at? And, and John Hitchcock was like, it's Dusty's booking. They're, they're not coming. I, just, uh, like, I, I was an eye. I was an eyewitness to that. Yeah, yeah. So, that, that, oh, okay. So I, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So you, um, you actually heard John, that. Oh yeah. Everything that John says is true. Except for he may not have been the only person involved. <laughs> I'll put it like that. So, um, but yeah, if you read his book, those, all that stuff is true. I mean, yeah, yeah, I, and I, I don't doubt it. I didn't doubt anything you say, and I, it, it's yeah. just it's just awesome to get like your perspective on it too to uh, to to hear because again, like I'm a at like 85. I'm 10 years old. I'm 12 by 87, 13 by 88. I started kind of like drifting away from wrestling by around 88. I, I just hit those teenage years, and I was like, eh, it's not as cool as it once was. I kind of watched, but I was in and out. You know, that's it's just how it was. So I kind of like missed, I guess, the time frame. I didn't completely miss it, but I don't have good memories of Dusty being, you know, that whole burnout thing that people had on Dusty with the book in and you know him and and all that that you just talked about. So it's a good perspective uh, to listen to. Yeah, and when you watch, you know, when you watch, you'll see you'll see some of it. Um, and then, you know, there was the stuff, and I know John's talked about this, but there's like the famous, um, the, the famous file that baby doll had on him, you know, what's in her, you know, what's yeah. in her and that they never revealed because they just dropped it. But the thing, it, when you see that skit, when dusty responds to it, the thing that's hilarious about it is he gets Jim Crockett to buy him a Rolex watch. This is real. And then they present it to him for being, you know, the most fabulous person on earth. And Dusty takes it and just kind of throws it away like you would, you know, it's like someone handed you, um, you know, a pack of cigarettes. You know, you didn't want to smoke. It's like he just kind of looks at it and goes, eh. you know, it's like another day. You know, everybody like gave Dusty Rose expensive watches all the time. It was like it was just another day. So his, you know, like his ego was so far out of control and they didn't adjust. You know, they had – you know, and and as fans, we thought, oh my God, they got the UWF guys. Those are some great. They got the Freebirds. They got they got um, Ted DiBiase. They got Eddie oh, Gilbert. Yeah. All these guys, and and they didn't. And then you know, Dusty either didn't get them. You know, and who can blame Ted DiBiase for doing what he did and go play the million dollar man? It made, you know, he made more money and made his yeah. career. But the um, but the rest of them was just like, okay, we're just going to prove that the same old guys are better. You know, and they just they just killed him dead. And you just you know you you want to see Doctor Death versus Flair. You thought that was a Doctor Death Steve Williams versus Flair. You thought that was a dream match um, because Doc was considered the toughest guy in wrestling. And um, and then the one th but the one thing you didn't want to do is let Doc talk. So they didn't make him into the toughest guy in wrestling, and they had him talk. And it was it went from people really interested in seeing Ric Flair versus you know versus the UWF, you know, the NWA champion versus the UWF champion. And, um, and they gave him, they gave 
doc kind of a fake push, but um, it was, you know, it just it just died out. And so when you watch that stuff, you'll see it from the everything's great perspective. That's what wrestling promotions do. But the arenas start getting darker, the crowds got, start getting there, and while there's great, to, there's good to great stuff, and a lot, you know, the Fantastics and Midnight Express and that kind of thing, it's going downhill and they, they don't make the change and it was you know really frustrating to see because i think they you know they were the ones that did have the chance at the time to to battle and um you know and 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 as wcw showed you, you could battle at that point people will accept more than one promotion they won't now but they they would back then so um as main event you know as major league and so that's that's part of that story <laughs> 